I promise this is the last time you'll see me today. This has been a great afternoon, and, and uh, I know that all of you have been as entranced as I have by the afternoon so far. I think what you're going to see now will take it even further for you. Um, this is a piece that was created, uh, conceived and adapted for the stage by Mr. Gregory Hinton, who is with us today. I can't see out there, but Greg, if you're out there, please stand up and take a, take a bow for us. With original music uh, composed by our pianist and music director, Mr. Sean Kirchner. And as I said earlier, um, there are CDs. After you see this today, you are going to want these CDs. And they are available in the lobby and will be after the performance. We also want to give special thanks to um, Focus Features and um, Jerry Seamus and the... Uh, Jerry? Did I get the name right? Um, James Seamus. I knew I didn't get the name right, Jerry. It just didn't sound right. James Seamus and Focus Features uh, for this great film. And we want to give special thanks as the writings, the readings that you're going to here are based on the writings of the ultimate Brokeback Forum from this book, Beyond Brokeback, The Impact of a Film. I understand we have some members of the ultimate Brokeback Forum in the audience, so let's get down to it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dave Cullen. More than 10 million people went to see Brokeback Mountain after, after it opened in the winter of 2005. For some of them, it was just a movie. But others walked out of the theater feeling like something had been ripped open inside of them. They talked to friends, to family, to roommates, to therapists. Some found what they needed there, others kept on looking. Thousands found each other on a website called the Ultimate Brokeback Forum. Some came to discuss the film, others needed to talk about themselves. Some of us saw a little more on the screen than we were comfortable with. Even before the film's release, it started. The trailer called us on our bullshit. There are lies we have to tell, one of the captions read. There are truths we can't deny. Lies we have to tell, do we? When did we accept that? And what price did we pay? Jack and Ennis paid pretty dearly, and watching them swallow up their lies was what it finally took for some people. Many of us left the theater fired up. We'll never know how many slept on it and thought better of it. Maybe they could live with those lies. But we, should, we couldn't shake this film. It aided us for days or weeks. It demanded change that wasn't going away. The forum drew more than half a million posts in its first year. But the more startling figure concerns all the people who did not post. Fifty to a hundred thousand came by each month to silently witness. They had a unique position to watch from. Thousands of lives changed before our eyes on this forum. First, we shared the fictional lives, Jack and Ennis getting ripped apart on the screen in the dark. Then we saw what these guys did to us. Not just the immediate reaction in the lobby or over drinks an hour later. The lasting effect, months down the road. Who changed? Who didn't? With all the unexpected turns in our own stories. So many changes. I never foresaw that. I wish I could say I created Ultimate Brokeback Forum to help all these people. It never crossed my mind. Never occurred to me that they would need it. The intensity of the fallout from this film took me by surprise. I started the website just to help the film. It was the audience who was left in need.
his friend. The story, which I reread for the first time since it appeared in the New Yorker in 1997, and the general air of expectancy around the film had made me eager to see it, but nothing could have prepared me for the impact of that first viewing. As my friends and I left the theater, we exchanged no more than two or three sentences about the film, both of us feeling overwhelmed and stunned in the silence. I'm consumed. I'm cursed. There's so many memories, so much pain. I successfully buried most of it until this movie brought it all to back. I actually convinced myself I was happy. Doing okay, but I'm so lost and so very alone. I just got back from milking 95 head of cows. It gives me time to think about what I've been feeling. The credits roll, and I hurry to grab my coat and straighten my baseball cap. Fearful that every emotion I was laughing off to myself in order not to let them out would pour out into the lobby. I couldn't look anyone in the eye for fear I wouldn't know how to speak to them. I stumble out, confused, with a piercing pain in my chest and stomach. My phone rings and I find it hard to breathe and speak to my ex on the line. I huff out, I just saw broke back now. I really can't talk right now. I did get up and turn around, I was alone, as the others sitting behind me had already left. So no one saw how red my eyes were. I don't recall having a desire to go out and see Brokeback Mountain. I think I assumed it would be all gay bash, and who would want to see that? Plus, I didn't want to get my heart broken. You stagger out of the cinema in days. It hit me like a missile. I was stuck. I sat in the theater alone after everyone left. <clears throat> it has made me think, reach out, contact the love of my life, consider making geographic moves. In short, it ripped down every wall I'd ever built around my heart. Why do some people walk out of the theater and go to dinner and talk about the weather? Others walk out to find that the horizon's been erased. Are we so powerfully affected by this movie because so much of our lives are and this movie won't let us be numb? I met a friend at a party a month after I'd seen Brokeback Mountain. As usual, we discussed some movies we recently attended, and he asked me about the Ang Lee film. I blurted out, I can't get it out of my soul. I think Ang Lee should get his ass over here and clean up my house. <laughs> it's not my fault I can't get anything done. And after he's done with your house, he needs to come to my house and help my kids with their homework. The teachers at school probably think I'm out of town and my husband's in charge. Brokeback provided us with a language of loss that we could all understand. It hit us directly in the heart and ripped our protective layers to shreds. It left us vulnerable and raw, but also alive. Brokeback cannot give meaning or purpose to our lives, but it has exposed the need shown us that we may have lost our direction, and we need to reclaim it. We all have stories to tell, just as I'm sharing part of mine here. Our stories are fundamental to how we make sense of the world, how we know and understand one another through our joy and suffering. Our stories embody our hopes and dreams and future possibilities. I am Scottish, and I live in Spain. I have just come virgin-like to Brokeback. This dropped a depth charge into my very existence, blowing away all the digressive rubbish 50 years on the planet has filled my brain with, reminding me, perhaps just in time, that love in all its forms is the only imperative to which the soul should learn. Ang and the gang, you should be very proud. This is a life-changing work of art. Remember those two shirts? That smell of grass and mountain air? Lingering. Our face and memory, our threadbare sleeves entwined, come home to me now. I left pieces of me on the road for you to find. Is there anything more than darkness at the end of our journey? Jack! Jack! Jack? Jack. 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 I live in the general region of Childress, where the movie was banned. And well remember the gay bashings and murders that were not uncommon around here during the late 70s and early 80s and 
even still. A friend of mine, for a while, was more than that. He was one of many innocent victims. I can't begin to imagine the impact this movie has and will continue to have on my life. Brokeback Mountain hit me like a Mack truck. It ran right over my body and left tire tracks, indelible and permanent, on my soul. Every day for more than a month, during long walks, I confronted long suppressed memories and struggled to come to grips with the demons those memories freed. My first memory, a happy one, stretches back to the age of five or six. I was holding my grandmother's hand as she introduced me to her cowboy pals, Bud and Manuel. From their scuffed leather boots to their weathered Stetsons, they looked like real men. Lean, muscular, with big calloused hands and strong faces, tanned by the sun. Bud owned a cattle ranch. Manuel was his foreman. They built barbed wire fences and rode the range together on horseback. Later on, I realized they also shared a bed. Bud and Manuel were gay cowboys, even though neither man would have known what gay meant 60 years ago. In those days, gay, for, gay folk were called queers and homos. Nobody but Bud and Manuel would have dared ask if they were gay, but everybody sensed that Bud belonged to Manuel. They were an inseparable pair, just like my grandmother's married friend. I've thought a lot about Bud and Manuel after viewing Brokeback Mountain. They are long gone, but I wish they were here to share their story with me. How did they forge a relationship in rural California in the 1940s? Three visual metaphors from Brokeback Mountain echo in the memories of every gay man who came out when Ennis and Jack were struggling to accept their love. The closet, the bloody shirts, and the tie iron. Most gay men were wedged in closets so tight and airless, we could hardly breathe. We all had our bloodied shirts, the secrets and pain and hurt we experienced. We all feared the tire iron that could strike suddenly and violently. My gay friends have been attacked with everything from broken bottles and baseball bats to rocks and ice picks. Brokeback Mountain started me on a journey of self-healing. During my walks, I confronted many things I long suppressed. Everything came spilling out, and with the help of my friends, I worked through it all. I wouldn't trade that journey for anything. It has led me to self-understanding and self-acceptance. I call it the Brokeback Miracle. Everyone should have the opportunity to watch Brokeback Mountain. And this masterpiece is a weapon against ignorance, intolerance, and the like. Rambaud thought that poetry can change a life. Well, I'm one of those who believe that Brokeback Mountain can change a life. I'm a 56-year-old divorced woman. I have had such an incredible experience after watching Brokeback Mountain. I'm still sorting out my emotions. I had low expectations going into the movie, due to all the hoopla and negative comments. I was not prepared any way for what happened to me as I watched it. I have never understood how people of the same sex could love each other like a man and woman. I've tried in my life to come to terms with this, but without much success. Then, as I was sitting there, watching Ennis and Jack. It started to hit me with such power, I couldn't control it. That's what Brokeback Mountain did for me. I know how beautiful love between two men can be. I have to stop now because I am crying and I'm overcome with my emotions. Cost of movie tickets, $42 for six showings. <laughs> Weight gained by a diet of popcorn, junior mints, and cherry coke, 7.3 pounds. 
boxes of Kleenex to dry unexplained bouts of crying. Four. Money spent on eBay on an I Heart Gay Cowboys t-shirt. $13 plus $5 shipping. <laughs> Believing in love again as I watch the dozy embrace. Priceless. A lot of people, myself included, have been confused and a little freaked out by their strong emotional reactions to Brokeback Mountain. To wit, the tears that seem almost non-stop in the weeks after first seeing the movie, or reading the book, and that seemed to kick right back in at the drop of a cowboy hat in the months that followed. Some have said it felt like Brokeback Mountain uncovered a well of sadness in them they didn't know existed, which also applies to me. What didn't make sense to me was why people with seemingly little in common, male or female, straight or gay, happily married or divorced, single or partnered, all ended up the same way, sobbing as if our hearts would break. I think each of us who's had this reaction has experienced severe emotional wounding that up until now has never been healed by grieving. I also think that the reason we've not grieved up until now is that the wounding, even though severe, was a slow process. So slow that many of us didn't even know we had been hurt until we saw the slow, indisputable proof laid out before us on the screen or page and realized that, to varying degrees, was the story of our own lives being told. I'm a lesbian. <laughs> and I'm struggling to find happiness. I have issues to resolve with a special lady in my life. I have some individuals in my past who linger in my memories as a disappointment. Of course, there are also straight women around me today who cannot return my affections, even if some of them in another world would feel safe to explore that side of themselves. So, the movie hit me well, it, it hit home for me. The concepts of lost love, of impossible circumstances, of waiting, of hoping, of settling for crumbs, when you are capable of giving so much more. I'm 61. No man who is gay does not live in the closet, betraying the truth about himself, Denying who he is by presenting himself as who he is not. Often many times a day. In the bank, in the laundry, at the gas station, to a neighbor, to a stranger. Not just for convenience, but out of fear, mistrust, anxiety. That is a low-grade constant. Because no gay man has not seen the hostility, not encountered the contempt at one time or another. Few have not felt personally threatened. Many have felt the smashing blows. Every gay man at one time knows the toll this disdain or derision takes. But if it is sometimes dealt with ably, too often, it is not. I grew up in Jackson, Wyoming, before it was a ski area. It was a way of life. The last century has changed things around here in Wyoming a fair amount but maybe not as much as most of the world. I think it has to do with the harshness of the landscape. A lot of people who come here don't appreciate the wild, sheer majesty of this part of the world. That's what I love about it the most. I have to say, when I'm around large groups of people, I'm apprehensive. But when I'm in the middle of a ground blizzard, I feel comforted. I don't know what to expect from people. But while this country is unforgiving, if you respect it, you will be rewarded with wonders beyond belief. A few days ago, I visited Porcupine Hills, which is near Broken Back Mountain in the Big Horns. This broke back has an N in it. <laughs> On the way back up, I lost my footing and I fell. I knocked over a rock and there was one of those lapel pins underneath. It was all rusted up. I could still read the inscription. Are we over the rainbow yet? It was nobody's business but theirs. And yet, standing above, sentinel, a tree took in, along with sunlight, this radiance of an arm, a leg embracing madly the other one, sheen of flank and thigh, dark hair light, 
bodies twisting. A vow, a threat, a promise. Of loves beyond love's own tired meaning. They imagine themselves invisible, yet sighing as they did. The boughs and the wind watched, trembling as they did. They long to embrace, too. The embrace upon the pine's own scattered needles. Summer ended. Years passed. A tree cut down. Firewood. But within the fire from 63 glowed there the memory of a love long past. An after image, like the sun behind the clouds, behind closed eyes.